playing Spec Ops The Line was truly an experience. Never before has a game connected me to its main protagonist this well while also telling me how much of a bad person I am for doing so. Spec Ops The Line is not a happy game. It's one that will attempt to tear you apart and will succeed in doing so so long as you keep playing. And today, I want to take some time to talk about my experience with this game. So without further ado, let's get started. I honestly cannot do better than the game itself when it comes to describing what Spec Ops The Line is all about. Before you start the game, you can already tell something is wrong, as the main menu shows an upside-down American flag flying over a recently destroyed Dubai, while the American National Anthem is playing over a loudspeaker across the country. It's also out of tune at some points, and even stops mid-song, which connects to the utter destruction right in front of us. This is already a good start, but you could go even further back than this. The Xbox Game Store has screenshots from the game you're currently looking at to help you get an idea as to what you're getting into. And while games like Call of Duty and Battlefield show bombastic action with explosions, big guns, and vehicles, Spec Ops shows this. If that doesn't immediately convey the kind of tone we're going for here, I don't know what will. I'll be mentioning those other games and a few more shooters throughout this video quite a bit, as it's key to understanding this game, because Spec Ops The Line is a typical shooter game, which is a problem as it had to go up against some of the behemoths of the genre around this time. But where those games tend to focus on big explosions and heroic stories, Spec Ops wanted to stand out for the rest, and it all starts in Dubai. In the world of Spec Ops, Dubai was hit by a massive sandstorm that practically destroyed the entire city. Four and eight of rescue teams were sent in to investigate and assist any who needed it. One person was Colonel Conrad and his battalion, the Dam 33rd. Everything seemed okay, all things considered, until a distress call came back from Conrad himself, saying that the evacuation was a failure and that they need help. This is where we come in. Delta Force, under the command of Captain Walker, our protagonist, along with his squad mates Lugo and Adams, were sent into Dubai to assess the situation and radio for evacuation. One thing I noticed right away is how well the game characterizes our squad mates. Walker is the very boring and generic commander, which is completely fine as he's being controlled by us. Adams is your standard military man who takes things very seriously, and Lugo is the comedic relief. When he's right, he's right. This is hey, command wants us to look around, we look around. I don't know. Sounds like a waste of three stone-cold, ruggedly handsome Delta operators such as ourselves. Think of it as a paid vacation. Well, for future reference, I prefer my beaches with a three-to-one sexy lady dead body ratio. Lugo, do you ever actually hear the shit coming out of your mouth? <clears throat> no, I do not, sir. I find it messes with my rhythm. Being comedic relief can have the downside of being the character's only personality. A great example I tend to point to when it comes to comedy done well is Cole and Baird from Gears of War. The majority of their dialogue is wisecracks and jokes, but they take things seriously when they need to, and they also have moments where they come to terms with certain problems in their life. This creates a healthy balance of both, and I think Lugo nails this really well. He and Adams are kind of like the angel and devil that sits upon Walker's shoulders. Lugo tends to want to save people, and is vehemently against mortar striking a squad later due to the weapon they are using, whereas Adams is comfortable with said weapon. That being said, they don't stay this way for very long, as both end up crossing over to each other's sides, which shows just how much this mission changed everyone. As they approach a broken down convoy, the team finds one of the 33rd soldiers along with a few locals who ambush them. Apparently, these guys are the survivors of the storm, which is a good thing as this is the people we are trying to find, but obviously they're attacking us, which is not a good thing. In all fairness though, we are three soldiers armed to the teeth, so we do come off as a bit of a threat. That being said, Walker and the team don't attempt to radio this in, and instead push further into the city and attempt to find out what's going on. Along the way, the player will get introduced to the gameplay, and it's honestly quite difficult to discuss because it's exactly what it looks like. Spec Ops The Line is your run-of-the-mill third-person cover base shooter. This game, like others of its kind, do try to add some unique elements to the gunplay, like shooting glass ceilings and windows to drop sand on people, but outside of that, if you've played a game like this, then an in-depth description of its mechanics isn't necessary. This whole system is a strangely shaped double-edged sword, though. Spec Ops The Line was going against some real heavy hitters in the industry, not just the big names like Call of Duty or Battlefield, but the specific games within those franchises. Just a year before this game, Battlefield 3 was released. Black Ops 2 was released the same year as Spec Ops, and games like Halo 4 and Gears 3 also surrounded it. Now, while only one of those is a cover-based shooter, all these games have much better mechanics than Spec Ops does. This same sentiment is actually how I feel about most of the mechanics or systems in this game. As a sum of parts, it's okay, but other games do each thing better. This became an issue on release, as Spec Ops wasn't exactly reshaping the mold in any way, as they preferred to just play it safe. But this is where that other edge comes in, because nowadays, people are likely to not buy this game for the gameplay, given how many games do it better. So it ends up being the story that people are here for. I want to clarify, I don't find the gameplay to be bad. Like I said, it's a very basic cover shooter, and I have no problem with the genre. I'm just describing this to you as it's the same thing we discuss when talking about Metal Gear Survive, but the other way around. 
That game had a real lack of story for most of the game, so the gameplay was the thing that needed to keep people interested, but to me, it wasn't able to. Spec Ops The Line is likely not going to win people over with the gameplay, so it's on the story to do so, which works given that that seemed to be the entire point. The team behind the game, called Jaeger Development, really put all their eggs in one basket here. As the part of the game that seems to have gotten the most care and consideration was the story, as the rest feels thrown together because they needed to, but thankfully it worked as the story is the strongest aspect by far. As the trio continues to the wreckage of Dubai, they'll find another 33rd member trapped in a plane. After carefully executing the insurgents, he'll tell the group that one of their men was taken to a place called The Nest. While they walk, the team naturally discusses what to do next, which is what leads Walker to say that their mission has went from recon to rescue very quickly, and that they need to get the US soldiers out of here. Remember this for later. This section of the game is where I start to get a little nervous though. While we fight some more militia members, rock music is playing in the background, and while it added to the fight, it sometimes felt more horrific than it was supposed to be, as this isn't a one-time thing, as most of the battle music in the game is actually played through a speaker by a DJ here, which is an interesting way of canonizing battle music in games. But still, the music would sometimes play out very softly in these rundown areas with hundreds of bodies in it, and it kind of gives off this eerie feeling like something's not right here. Which, speaking of that, Jaeger did a really good job of conveying the eeriness throughout most of the game. Some of it's a bit more obvious at times, but things like spray paint saying things like God help us or please grant us mercy, or just the overall architecture of the place really does a good job at establishing how run down and destroyed this version of Dubai is. After battling through waves of locals and falling into a sand pit, we find an American guy working for them. At the time, it was safe to assume that the Dubai locals were revolting against the American soldiers that were stationed here to help them. And while that's still a fair assumption to have right now, it's clear that something else is going on underneath the surface thanks to this guy. Around this time is also where Walker will find a doll. This is a collectible piece of intel in the game, and while I won't go through every piece of intel, I do want to highlight this one specifically. According to Walker, the materials it's made out of point to this being made after the dust storm, meaning that there are people who are still here that aren't just the local militia. This weighs on Walker quite heavily, as he starts to question if the people he was supposed to save are the people he's currently killing. He ends up rationalizing this by saying that anyone who shoots at him is his enemy, regardless of if they have families or not. Something quite consistent about Walker is his ability to rationalize his horrific decisions, some of which are impossible to, no matter what way you look at them. It's actually quite impressive though, as usually this kind of thing would create a disconnect between the player and the player character. But I found myself agreeing with Walker's decisions. Well, most of them, anyway because he and I both recognize that while things are starting to get bad, it's all going to end well once we take control, as we have a good heart and want to help people. Yeah, we're killing a lot of people, but the killing will stop once we reach our objective and radio command for evacuation. This section of the game is where a part of that mindset started to develop. As the trio finally catches up to that American guy we found earlier, who was immediately killed thanks to us distracting him. The guy who killed him is conveniently the person we are supposed to find, who tells us that he's with the 33rd, and that the man we just saw die in front of us was from the CIA, more specifically a CIA task force called... Grey Fox. God damn it. A few more intel pieces we can pick up before this point to certain events of this tragedy being covered up. A reporter was sent here by a news station to cover the tragedy, but the teleprompter told her that an evacuation force was coming to rescue them, despite the fact that this was something she had not heard of before. This all but confirms that someone has an ulterior motive here and is trying to do something here in Dubai. This guy, though, is reluctant to help us, and actually sends some of his men to kill us, who are once again the 33rd, the people we're trying to find. Here is where me and Walker started to rationalize things, because now we're killing the people we're trying to rescue. Originally, I agreed with Walker and said that while this is definitely not how things should be going, we're almost done here, and it was only a couple of on-edge soldiers who have to fight for their lives since they arrived. I started to retract that statement an hour or so later, though, when I realized I was still fighting the 33rd Battalion. In fact, I don't think you ever fight another local insurgent member again. I'm fairly certain every single enemy from this point forward is a member of the 33rd. This is where the game started to confuse me, as I couldn't figure out what was going on here. We just went from helping the locals, to killing the locals, to helping the 33rd, to now killing them. It's bizarre and made me confused as to what the hell we were even doing anymore, which was completely intentional as you're supposed to be confused. The game is purposely trying to toy with you and make you question what you're even doing here. To circle back to the interaction with the soldier though, this is one of our first choices in the game, even though it doesn't mean much. Oddly enough, I was going to wait to discuss the choices until a bit later when we get to the hanging part, but I found out later on a different playthrough that you could just shoot this guy instead of letting him walk away. Actually, quite a few of the choices in this game are like this, where they're choices you may not have known are actually a thing. In this case, I didn't even know you had a choice. I thought him leaving was supposed to happen, but it's not, and I have to admit that's pretty damn cool. For the next few minutes, we're going to be running through various buildings and are forced to take out more 33rd members along the way, and it's here where I want to highlight two things. 
One is the dialogue. I've played a lot of shooters in my time, but I've never heard dialogue like this before. No one ever shuts up in this game. Delta Force and the 33rd constantly communicate with each other all the time, and not only does it feel incredibly realistic, but it's almost overwhelming at times. There is rarely a moment where things just stop. People are either screaming or dying, and guns never seem to stop firing. It's just a lot at once, and it really brings you into the action. It might be a bit hard to hear, but I find that that's what's so brilliant about this, as these guys are literally screaming at the top of their lungs and you can still barely hear them over the constant gunfire. It also makes the squad feel more like a team rather than a player in two unimportant NPCs, because a lot of this dialogue is something you'll hear throughout the game. Each of them will call out knife and shotgun users all the time, and comments from them about enemies pinning them down or how one of them is rushing towards the team is also something you'll hear in regular combat throughout the game. I think it's a large reason why, despite its simplicity, I enjoyed the gameplay, because I was always mentally thrown into the fight thanks to all the shit going on around me. This constant state of being on edge and making sure to stay alert of enemies nearby ended up creating the second moment I want to highlight, and that's this section right here. While fighting, the player is forced to go down this hallway and flank the machine guns, while Lugo and Adams distract it, and among the soldiers is a random civilian who walks into your line of fire. While there are some civilians in this level, most are either killed before you get the chance to save them, or they're hiding far away from the fight. This is the one time a civilian actually runs in front of you, and it honestly shocked me. When I shot this woman, I was originally confused why the reticle was green, and was wondering if all the soldiers were green too, as a sort of meta message that we're shooting the good guys. But no, every soldier shows up red like normal, and that's when I realized that this was just some random old lady I shot. What's even more surprising is that the game lets you continue with this. Usually in games with civilians, you're either given a warning or just straight up fail the mission if you kill a civilian, but Spec Ops lets you continue. I thought for a long time as to why they let you do that, not even knowing that later, one old woman would be the least of my problems. As we clear out of the building, the refugees who originally made this place their home want us to leave. You might question why, and I did too. We just saved them, but realistically, we really didn't. The 33rd at the moment seemed to be the bad guys, but not only is that information spotty at best, we also destroyed the civilians' home in the process of trying to save them. Yeah, the 33rd looked like they were rounding up people and killing them, likely because of an earlier scene where we saw some of the soldiers butchered and executed, but still, we didn't exactly make their current situation any better. Plus, it's not even taking into account the amount of people that died while this battle happened. A common story beat in this game is Delta Force coming in to quote-unquote save the day, only to make the situation worse than it was when they got there, and this is one of those moments. Once they leave, they come across a signal from Lieutenant Daniels. The group then decides to find him with the hope that Conrad is nearby, but they also recognize that this was broadcasted on purpose, likely to lure out other CIA members. And it's around here where the game starts to turn from an action hero movie to something a bit more sinister, as right under this pile of rubble is hundreds of dead bodies. There are so many bodies in here, it's hard to tell where one ends and the other begins. It's also hard to tell if it's blood, burn marks, or both. Plus, we also have to ask why this is even here. According to Walker, these guys are a part of the 33rd, but the people who own this building are also the 33rd, meaning the group turned on each other and this was the result. Hundreds of corpses are put together to form a dumping ground, while the rest are tied up in chairs. A nearby intel file will give us a bit more insight into these specific methods of torture here. These men were waterboarded, cut with knives, and even burned. It seems like the writer of the note was someone who went through this torture and decided to enact it on the same people who did it to him a bit later. But in his case, it seems like it wasn't for the purposes of information. It doesn't take hundreds of people to get the information you need, so he likely did it as payback. Once again, this is all well and good, but we still don't know what the hell is going on here. It's bad enough that the 33rd was being attacked by the CIA, but now we learn that they turned on each other. Things start making even less sense after this, as the trio has been set up by the 33rd, which they expected, but what they didn't expect was that a CIA agent named Gould is here to save them. The player, like Delta Force, is really just going through the motions at this point, as no one has a solid grasp as to what's going on, and I would argue they never really learn the real truth until the very end of the game. 
The one piece of info we do learn is that the CIA seem to have stirred things up here in Dubai thanks to them arming the locals. So we have a group of American soldiers who may or may not have killed a bunch of people, infighting within the group itself, the locals who are taking up arms against the 33rd to take over the city, and then there's the CIA who armed these locals for some reason. Oh, and yeah, we have some jackass over the radio poking fun at Delta Force the whole time. This just in, tourism up an astounding 3,000% as a fresh wave of Americans make Dubai their vacation destination of choice. When asked what he thought of these fresh new faces, a local Dubai man had these words to say. <laughs> to say the story is confusing is an understatement, but once again, it's supposed to be, and the story will eventually come back around to tie up these loose ends, so it's not like it's going to keep you confused for very long. Shortly following that lovely segment is the 33rd's attempt at preventing more insurgencies, as they've opted to kill those that betrayed them and hang the bodies as a warning. Wonderful. Right behind this is another tunnel filled with dead bodies that belong to the insurgents. So Gould and his CIA friends use the locals as bait so they can get in closer. But, and I don't even know how this is even possible at this point, it gets even worse. As the moment we come out of the tunnel, white phosphorus is dropped onto the survivors. I have a lot to say about this particular weapon later, so we'll circle back to this in a moment. After carefully walking around the body so as to not catch fire, they'll come across Gould and a few civilians who are being held captive. One of the soldiers uses a unique form of torture that I've never seen before. In order to get Gould to talk about the CIA, they take a woman and unload an entire clip right next to her. I was originally confused as to what this would have accomplished, but I'm assuming the bullets going into the sand would have kicked it up in her face. Plus, the bullets are also red hot when firing out of a gun, so there's a good chance it's burning her too. Plus, there is of course the more obvious point, and that's that a full mag of a gun being shot right next to you is extremely loud and terrifying to hear. Gould doesn't talk though, so the soldier next to him just caps her right after. From here though, we have two choices, save the civilians or save Gould. Oddly enough, Lugo wants to save Gould and not the civilians, which is something I'm a bit puzzled about as he seems to be a bit more of a caring individual than Adams is. But Lugo does make a good point by saying that while it does suck, Gould is vital to our mission. My initial decision was to save the civilians, as Gould's loyalty is questionable at best, but I screwed up and ended up doing the other choice instead. The game didn't really give me a clear indication of what option I was choosing, so I figured that this was the option I wanted. I realized later that I should have followed Adams as going to the left would have taken me to the civilians I wanted to save. Regardless, if you save the civilians, Gould is dead. If you save Gould, the civilians die, a ton more guys come out to fight, and then Gould dies anyway. Both outcomes result in Gould dying, which kinda sucks, but it makes sense, as him not being alive to give them info on a place called The Gate is going to cause some problems for them very soon. Before we can get there though, some infighting within the group starts to emerge. The Dubai desert is really affecting these three, as all their emotions and nerves have gone off the rails, and it's hard to blame them. Any normal person would be in a state of disarray after the stuff we've talked about. Walker attempts to calm the two down, but you can tell the two are going to snap again the next time something happens. Unfortunately, that next time is right now, as we're about to enter probably the most gut-wrenching scene in the game. Right in front of the team is an army of 33rd soldiers. Adams recommends using the mortar cannon nearby filled with white phosphorus. Lugo is completely against it and reminds Walker that he knows what this thing does to people, and as the player, we also know this as we just saw it in action just a few moments ago. Now, I thought this was another choice, but the game forces you to use this device, as enemies seem to lock onto you immediately the moment you move out of cover, so it's impossible to take all of them out without using the mortar. So we have no choice but to use the white phosphorus, and as expected, it's very efficient. Now, white phosphorus may seem like a normal explosive, but you may not be aware of the full extent of its destruction. White phosphorus is a chemical that can ignite almost immediately when exposed to air. The problem comes when trying to extinguish it, as simply cutting off the oxygen is only temporary, as the moment you remove the lid covering it, it will reignite again. Even if you douse it in water, it will eventually reignite once the water evaporates. Furthermore, this thing releases a lot of fumes, so anyone caught in this thing will be inhaling all of that smoke, completely ruining their lungs and internal organs. That's also not even considering the more obvious problem, and that's the burns from being hit by it, as this thing goes as high as 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is such a deadly weapon that it's been banned by the UN. Now it seems as though as long as the chemical is used in less lethal ways like smoke grenades it seems to be fine, but I've read conflicting information that it's both outright banned or only okay to use against soldiers and not civilians, but it's also war and rules kinda go out the window when it's life or death. To my surprise though, Spec Ops was not the first game I played that had this, as I forgot until now that Call of Duty also used this in Modern Warfare 2019. And while that mission didn't put a major focus on the weapon itself, there was still an underlying feeling of concern, as the weapon was more than successful at destroying the base we were attacking. And if Call of Duty, a game where most of the action is focused on fun heroic moments, can still take the time to show how destructive something like this is, 
How do you think Spec Ops handled this? This... This was too much. Stop talking. What'd you just say? It means the smoke is toxic. Let's just keep going. Nothing we can do. Why? You brought this on yourself. We were helping. What? While this is bad enough as is, the next part is even worse. I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to show, as this isn't very ad-friendly of me, but around us is a pile of burned corpses, with the one that sticks out from all the rest being a mother holding her child in her arms, both of whom are dead. If there was ever a scene in this game that would stick with the player the most, it's this one. Not only are we still killing American soldiers, but we also wiped out an entire group of civilians in the process. The choice to use a mother and child was smart, as it's the most common thing media will use when conveying something disastrous and evil as it shows us that the person responsible was willing to kill a mother and child to get what they wanted, and Walker, and by extension the player, did just that. I also love the small detail of having Walker's face appear on the screen when you fire, as it's an attempt at showing who's really behind the screen, that of course being us. It also does a good job of showing Walker's inability to admit what's right in front of him, and also his attempt to deflect the blame onto someone, as his first instinct is to blame the 33rd as they forced his hand. Lugo mentioned something like this earlier when he said that there is always a choice, but Walker disagrees and said that this time there wasn't. This is where I started to break away from Walker, as my first thought was exactly what Adam said. I was thinking, Christ, Walker, we're not even going to bring this up? I originally thought he was doing this so that he could remain calm and level-headed, as the other two were clearly losing their mind over what just occurred. But then I started to realize that it was because Walker was using the 33rd as a scapegoat in order to put the blame on someone else, which is definitely not the route I expected him to go down. This is also where the game officially starts to change in tone. If the past few minutes weren't enough to convince you that the game was going for something more serious this time, this surely would. What's really the cherry on top of all of this is that once again, we still have no damn clue what we're even doing here. It's been three hours since we started the game and we're halfway through it and we still have no clue who's on whose side and who the good guys are in all this. Usually I would say this lack of development is bad writing, but it works so well here in Spec Ops as it forces you to look back on the things you do understand which really hammers in those events of the story. I might not know if the CIA or the 33rd are the bad guys, but I do know that I just bombed a group of civilians and I don't really feel good about it. My only complaint with this scene, and it is incredibly minor, is that it was quite obvious that these were civilians from the moment I saw them on the tablet. My first thought when seeing them was, oh, these are definitely refugees, and the resulting explosion going off right near them pretty much convinced me that I had killed a bunch of innocents. From the way the scene is designed, it seemed like it was supposed to be a huge plot twist, but I noticed right away. That being said, it didn't take away from the scene at all, as I had no idea the amount of destruction that would follow. And the way the game forces you to walk through here so as to say, look at this, look at what you just did, was excellent. Much to the team's confusion, Walker demands that they move on and continue forward, as they still have a job to do. Lugo continues to poke at Walker over this decision, but he sticks with the fact that their hand was forced. Nearby is another room of tortured soldiers, is confirmed by none other than Conrad himself that they are some of the Rogue 33 members. Walker believes that all of this is Conrad's doing and that he isn't as good as he thought he was, so now we finally have something to go off of. Before we can digest that though, we have another choice. In front of us are two people, each of whom have committed some kind of crime and Conrad wants us to choose. The person we choose dies and the other lives. Conrad wants us to choose so that we can understand the kind of thing he has to go through every day. He wants us to make the hard decisions. So, what are they? Well, the man on the right tried to steal water for his family. He was caught and the man on the left was sent to bring him in, but ended up killing the other man's family in the scuffle. If you don't choose and instead stall for time, Delta Force will be shot and killed, so the player must choose. Personally, I think the choice is quite obvious, but I am interested to hear the other side of the argument. Between stealing water and killing a family, I think the more dangerous crime is obvious, which is why I chose to let the civilian live. If we are to use the game's logic here, his hand was forced. The Dubai desert is very deadly, and as we'll soon see later, the 33rd run the water in this city, so it's not just something you just go to the store and buy. You likely have to pass a few inspections to be eligible for it, and even then there's a good chance you can only take so much per person. 
So the man on the right was just trying to feed his family. The man on the left was a Marine. He's a trained killer and it's his duty to defuse situations like this and make the correct decisions. However, what we lack is context. How much water was it? Was it from the military or another family's home? Did the family attack the Marine, leaving him no choice but to put them down? It's one of those questions where it becomes harder to choose the more you think about it. So for me, I just look at what I know as there's no point in going back and forth on what ifs and hypotheticals if I'm never going to get them anyway. That's why I ultimately ended up choosing the civilian, but if you chose the Marine, I'd love to hear why, as maybe I missed something. It's once again another good choice from the game, but I do have some questions about this later as it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense with the last minute plot twist, but like I said, we'll talk about that at the end. Either way, right over this sand dune nearby is another group of 33rd waiting for the trio to pop their heads out. As they battle through the wreckage, a sandstorm hits, so they have to go find cover in a large drain pipe. They seem to stay here for quite a while as it becomes night when they exit. A little further down the road is where the team meets Riggs, another CIA agent. He's working with the locals to take over a nearby water facility, as taking it down would cripple the 33rd's hold over the area. So while the refugees go ahead and attract the 33rd, we and Riggs are going to go through the back and take them out. Conrad objects to our decision to help Riggs as he claims he's going to bury the truth, which ends up actually being correct, as stealing the water from the 33rd not only cripples them, but all of Dubai. Meaning all of the people left in the city are likely going to die in a few days, thanks to the last remaining supplies of water being destroyed. The reason Riggs did this was because the CIA wants to cover up what happened here. See, when the sandstorm hit, the city was in disarray, and that's when the US Army sent in Conrad and the 33rd to evacuate the civilians. This ended in a complete failure though, as he ended up getting over 1,300 people killed in the process. That radio transmission we hear in the beginning regarding the evacuation being a failure was this incident, and the broken down cars and dead bodies belonged to the people from this incident. Since Dubai was essentially shut off from the rest of the world, no one knew what happened or what was going on, so the CIA decided to cover up the incident by basically killing everyone left in the city, as if the Middle East found out what Conrad did, they would start a war with America, and the government knows that it's a war they can't win. Thanks to our ignorance though, Riggs got exactly what he wanted, and now Dubai has days before it's completely gone. The townsfolk are less than happy with us, as one of them berates us while the rest of them fill their jugs with whatever water is left. Riggs accidentally got caught in the blast and is stuck under the truck, which leads to our next choice, letting him die in the fire or mercy killing him with a bullet. I chose to let him burn, not just for deceiving us, but for thinking that killing all of Dubai is the right choice here. As if we needed more problems on our plate, Delta Force has been split up again so we have to regroup with Lugo and Adams, and Jackass returns once again to really emphasize how badly we screwed up. After a long firefight, the team regroups and also manages to find a surrendered soldier. He'll give us the location of the radio man, allowing us to finally take him down. He didn't get a chance to finish, but apparently his badge number was 8675309, which is a funny reference. This leads into another long combat encounter, and it's probably the longest the game goes on any sort of story progression, as we're going floor by floor in order to reach the top. But during this, you'll start to notice that Walker is changing, not just physically, but mentally. He kicks one of the soldiers when riding down a zipline, but the guy looks exactly like our squad mate Adams. This same thing will happen a bit later, but with a heavy gunner that's dressed like Lugo. Walker's mind has been conjuring up hallucinations. In fact, it's been happening since the start of the game, as this giant building has a poster of Conrad on it, but one of the loading screens in a later mission shows that it's actually just a woman. Furthermore, although I could be wrong, but this truck right after the water explodes also seems to have an image of Conrad on it. But this doesn't just extend to the hallucinations, but the actual combat as well. As I said earlier, the team likes to communicate orders constantly. Well, I noticed that as I got farther into the game, Walker's comments became more vulgar and angrier. The executions are also getting a lot more brutal, where now instead of punching them one or two times, he's either bashing in their skulls or executing them with his pistol. Walker is really starting to go down the wrong path here and is turning into a psychotic killer, although you could argue that's already happened. He's not the only one who's gone off the deep end though, as the trio finally makes it to the radio man. Lugo ends up giving him a piece of his mind, and while he has been a nice person up until this point, even angels can fall from heaven. Wow, that was easier than I expected. Thanks. <gasps> Get the fuck off me, man! Have you lost your fucking mind? Are you really this fucking naive? He kept the 33rd on our ass this whole time! He wasn't gonna let us just walk out of here! I did what was necessary! You don't get to make that call! Well, fuck you! I just did. That's enough! We'll deal with this later. Let's not kid ourselves here. Did the radio man deserve it? Yeah. Which is why I don't feel particularly bad about his current fate. But he surrendered and was never going to kill us. 
As Adam said earlier in the level, it's three armed men versus a man with an iPod. Their chances of dying to him were slim. Plus, since he was a part of the 33rd, he is yet again another person we were supposed to rescue but ended up killing. The radio man, now named Robert Darden, seemed to actually be an honest-to-god journalist. And he was, but the effects of Dubai had changed him like everyone else and turned him into a narcissistic radio man with a lack of empathy. In his words, he wanted to be the new Eddie Moreau given his current circumstances. Edward was a television host and news reporter. He was most well known for his reporting during the London Blitz in World War II, which the game references. It seemed like his appearances were met with positivity, as many people were able to keep up with the day-to-day goings-on in London, and it likely helped the people of London feel like there was always someone to turn to. He would then use this fame and popularity to start a TV docuseries called See It Now, which had a major focus on dismantling McCarthyism and was quite successful in doing so. Edward was also quite famous for his catchphrases, one of which I didn't even know was his, was the iconic good night and good luck. Always thought that was a dying light thing. Either way, given the situation here in Dubai, Robert saw the opportunity to do something like that, as he could have jumpstarted his career in radio and journalism. That's actually why he came to Dubai in the first place, as he was stationed alongside Conrad and was able to get first-hand information on the crisis. This allowed him to write daily reports about what was going on there, while also giving him a chance to uncover the real truth about that Dubai cover-up we talked about earlier. But obviously, none of his writings were published as he went manic thanks to his prolonged stay here in the Middle Eastern desert. Circling back to Walker's comment, he tells the people of Dubai that he's going to rescue them, but first they need to deal with Conrad. This leads to the trio taking a helicopter and flying to Conrad's position before a sandstorm knocks them out. What follows is a very weird dream-like sequence, which has Walker walking toward a giant burning tower. While in here, various characters we've met throughout the game walk toward us and condemn our actions. Conrad also comes by and says that 5,000 people currently live in Dubai. How many people do you think are alive now? It's meant to get the player and Walker to think about their actions, but surprisingly, here I was agreeing with Walker again. One thing Spec Ops The Line did really well, at least for me, was its ability to get me to side with Walker while also disagreeing with him constantly. I was on board in the early chapters and agreed that while things got tough, we would make it right once we win. Towards the middle is where I started to break off and thought that Walker was becoming unhinged, but somehow here I am back to agreeing with him again. And I think, just like Walker, we both had this naive hope that by the time we killed Conrad, we would win and be able to save the people of Dubai. And I was shocked, not only at the fact that I was still sticking by Walker, but also how both our hopes and dreams would be erased by the time the game ended. Before we get there though, we have to go rescue the crew again, as Delta Force are all separated. Adams was overrun by the 33rd, but we managed to save him in time. Lugo managed to make his way to a refugee camp, but the chatter over the radio suggests that something is going on. And by the time that we arrive, we see that the civilians had surrounded Lugo and hung him. Walker attempts to perform CPR, but it's too late. Lugo's gone, and they've killed him. But it's here where we're given another choice. The people won't leave until we shoot, so what do we do? While I love the white phosphorus scene, I think this might be the best part of the game for me, as it's something I had a choice in, and everything that had occurred in my head at this moment was astonishing. My first immediate reaction was to shoot them. They killed Lugo when he was a friend. It's probably why they made him the comedic relief as well as the one who dies, because everyone likes comedy. People who make you laugh are usually people you end up taking a liking to. But even without that, he was the one who was against the white phosphorus attack. It's another example of good people dying while those that terrorize and make a mess of the world get to live on. And I didn't want his death to be just another tally mark on a clipboard. Lugo, out of all three members of the squad, didn't deserve this, so I wanted payback. But I had thought during these brief few seconds about what I was about to do. Was I really about to kill a dozen or so people for revenge? That didn't sit right with me. So then maybe I thought shooting a couple shots into the first guy would work to let them know that we're serious, but then what's the point? I was ready to aim and shoot, but literally as my finger hit the trigger, in a split second decision, I stopped. Go! Why you still can't? I was seconds away from being no better than Walker. I had almost crossed the line, but as the achievement said, I held it. I had to reflect on that for a moment as I was surprised that my first choice was to fire into the crowd, but what would that solve? Yeah, they're all guilty of killing Lugo, but can you blame them? We've made their lives a living hell since we got here. We have blown up city blocks and killed hundreds of soldiers who are not only American soldiers like ourselves, but we're also helping the civilians survive, as harsh as their policies were, and we also destroyed all their water. Their lives, while still not great to begin with, would have been better had we not shown up. So in my eyes, they have every right to hang us. Hell, I'd argue that's a merciful punishment given what we just put them through. This conversation is also a good time to bring up one of my favorite pieces of intel, and that's a few loose bullets on a table. 
According to Walker, silver was something you would use to kill monsters, like how silver bullets were used to kill werewolves. While the refugees were melting down silver to use as ammo, thus making the soldiers the monsters. At the time, I thought this was a bit weird, but it makes a hell of a lot more sense now as Walker and the player have become the monster thanks to their decisions here in Dubai. That being said though, we've made it this far, so there's no point in giving up now, especially since Lugo's dead, so Walker and Adams take the fight to Conrad. Walker is committed to killing Conrad and putting an end to this, and while Adams agrees, you can tell this is all weighing on him, as he heavily implies that both he and Walker deserve the same fate as Conrad because of this. As the two reach an outpost that becomes surrounded by a group of men and a helicopter that says that if they don't surrender, they'll be shot. Walker puts his gun down, but Adams wasn't having it. Don't you dare! Well, fuck you then! I didn't come this far to surrender! It's the only way inside that tower! The fuck's sake! Give it up! The mission's over! We fell! Not while I'm still breathing! Fine! Then keep breathing! <laughs> Run, motherfucker! Adams knew the mission failed and was really just looking to go out in a blaze of glory. Walker wanted to keep going because he was still focused on the mission. But Adams didn't care, as he knew that this thing had been over for a while, and also knew that the only fate that he deserved was death, so might as well make it as glorious as possible. Thanks to Adam's sacrifice, though, we have finally come face to face with Conrad. We see a few men salute us, and then take an elevator to his quarters. We see him paint the scene of that mother and child again, saying that 47 innocent people died thanks to Walker's orders, and someone has to pay for those crimes. This painting is odd, though, as Conrad should know about this specific part of the attack, as he was never there. But then it starts making even less sense when we discover that not only is Conrad dead, but judging from the body, he's been dead before we even arrived in Dubai. Meaning every interaction with him wasn't real. It seems that reports of my survival have been greatly exaggerated. This is impossible. Oh, I assure you, it is. How? Not how. Why? You were never meant to come here. We have our orders. Leave the city, radio command from outside the storm wall. They send in the cavalry, we go home. What happened here was out of my control. Was it? None of this would have happened if you just stopped. But on you marched. And for what? We tried to save you. You're no savior. Your talents lie elsewhere. This is your fault, goddammit! Stop right there, Lugo! He wouldn't listen! We didn't have a choice! He turned us into fucking killers! This isn't my fault. It takes a strong man to deny what's right in front of him. And if the truth is undeniable, you create your own. What the hell happened? I don't know, he just stopped moving. Walker, snap out of it! I get it. We have to choose. The truth, Walker, is that you're here because you wanted to feel like something you are not. Lugo! You left me to die! I'm here because you can't accept what you've done. It broke you. Colonel? Colonel, please. What's going on, Walker? It's Conrad. He did it. All of it. You needed someone to blame. So you cast it on me. You're a dead man. I know the truth is hard to hear, Walker. But it's time. You're all that's left. And we can't live this lie forever. With all of that laid out, we are given a choice. Shoot Conrad or shoot ourselves. Before we get to that though, what a twist. That first part hit me like a truck and was actually the deciding factor regarding what ending I would choose. All this time I was talking about me and Walker agreeing on saving all these people despite how bad it's gotten, but both of us had completely forgotten that that wasn't even our original mission. All we were supposed to do was assess the situation and radio outside the storm wall, but instead, Walker decided he wanted to play hero and I went along with him. Also, speaking of twists, the game never points this out, but at the beginning of chapter 9 there's a memorial wall of all the rogue 33rd members. This not only shows how much Conrad cared for those men, even if they went against him, but on the wall are the names of Lugo and Adams, yet at this point in the game, neither of them have died. As for the rest of the scene, it's great, but I do have one issue with it though. This twist doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when in the context of the prisoner decision. If they were both dead from the start and all Walker did was look at two corpses, why are there snipers whose lasers are aimed at two dead bodies? Why did they run away when we made our choice? Why did they shoot us for not complying if there was never a choice to begin with? And why is Lugo and Adam's dialogue implying that they see these two guys and believe it's a real test? 
Walker is the only one hallucinating, so it makes no sense for them to be angry at Walker for killing one of the prisoners when they've already both been dead to begin with. Furthermore, Conrad told Walker that the CIA was here to cover up what happened in Dubai, but Conrad is just a hallucination, so how did Walker come up with that idea? Thirdly, if the radio was broken and nothing was coming out of it, why did all three of them move towards the radio even though Walker was the only one who could hear Conrad speaking? And finally, if Conrad doesn't exist, who made the painting? What I assume is going on here is that Jaeger went for a more emotional angle rather than a logical one. Recently on the channel we talked about Metal Gear and Death Stranding, and both those games have a few moments where logically nothing makes sense, but that's because it was sacrificed to tell a more emotional message. Logically, none of the aforementioned things make sense, but when looking at it what they mean emotionally, it fits a lot better, and I don't condemn the game for doing this. I never complain when a game sacrifices its logic for emotion, unless the plot is wildly inaccurate because of it and I don't plan on starting now. As for Conrad himself, well a few intel logs actually foreshadow his current condition. Colonel Conrad was a decorated war vet, but during a tour in Afghanistan he had failed in one of his missions, and that failure haunted him for a while. But thanks to his previous efforts he was deemed a hero, so he thought that he deserved to be one, which is why he came to Dubai to help, but just like Walker he ended up making it worse, which is what led to those 1300 people dying under his leadership. Prior to his death he wrote a letter to his wife and son, then killed himself after not being able to escape the guilt due to what happened here. Overall, it's a great twist, it really makes the player question what they're even doing here, and that's going to be important to remember for our final decision. Does Walker shoot himself, or shoot Conrad? Shooting Conrad means that Conrad's the one at fault and that Walker was trying to help people. Killing himself is, well, pretty self-explanatory. Walker realizes what he has done and decides that for the first time, he must answer for his crime instead of putting the blame on someone else. Earlier I said that this is what helped me come to my decision, which is true, but it was also, of all things, a loading screen. Spec Ops The Line, like all games, has a loading screen, but like Walker's dialogue, it changes the further in you progress. It starts with really simple things, like you can blind fire from cover, or a sandstorm has destroyed Dubai. It'll even occasionally throw in some thought-provoking questions, like if the radio man answers to the 33rd, then who works for Conrad? But then it gets... really dark. Like, do you feel like a hero yet? Do you even remember the mission? And if you were a better person, you wouldn't be here. There are a ton of these tips, and it would be hard to catalog all of them, but they all follow the same idea. It's the game telling us to look at ourselves and what we've become. It's why I've continuously mentioned the fact that the allegiances of the soldiers are confusing, because the whole time you're trying to figure out who the villain is, without even recognizing that it's been you the whole time. And this discussion with myself was what gave me my answer. If I had to make one of these choices and not go back and do the other ending for content, I probably would have shot myself. Shooting Conrad shows Walker talking to one of the men from earlier before realizing that they too didn't even exist, before calling for evacuation and being shipped out of Dubai by some US soldiers. While this is a good ending for Walker, not only can you shoot these soldiers instead of surrendering, allowing you to get an even more sinister ending, but more importantly, does Walker deserve that? Walker and the player are one and the same, and realistically do either deserve to walk out of here alive. We went against the mission and tried to play hero, which led to us presumably killing all of the 33rd Battalion, destroying 90% of Dubai, killing 47 people in a bombing, and are about to kill the rest of the city thanks to us destroying the last bit of water left. If I was Walker, I don't know if I could live with myself after that. And it's just like what Adam said, what do we deserve? Well Adams knew, and I knew too. Those more spiritual than I could argue that Walker could live on and repent and atone for his sins, which is a fair point. But it doesn't seem like he'll ever make a full recovery given his delirious state at the end of the game. Plus, how do you even atone for this kind of thing? This isn't something like saying the wrong thing to someone or stealing food. We killed hundreds if not thousands of people for nothing. Even though Dubai was already in ruins by the time we arrived, our presence actually made it worse the more we continued playing. Oddly enough, the team had actually planned on making a Far Cry style ending in which the player could leave Dubai after assessing the situation allowing them to get the true good ending, but they didn't add it to the game as it conflicted with the message. Regardless, I don't know if I could forgive myself if I was in Walker's shoes, which is why I chose the option I did. As I said earlier though, the player can choose to shoot the hallucination, which caused him to walk away while Conrad congratulates him for being lucky enough to leave with his life. He's then picked up by some soldiers who either escort him home if you drop his gun, or are fired upon if you decide to shoot. If you kill all of them, a crazed Walker gets on the radio and welcomes the new soldiers to Dubai. If you die, the soldiers will shoot Walker, and as his life slowly fades away, he reminisces about his time in Kabul with Conrad, in which they talk about going home. Conrad says that even if he wanted to, he can't go home, as for soldiers like him, if they're lucky enough, they do what's necessary, and then they die. That's why all he wants is peace, and as depressing as it sounds, Walker dying here will finally give him the peace he wanted. This ending is a really good example of this game's impressive attempt at portraying the villain. 
Spec Ops The Line is a great game because it's realistic. The villain isn't some evil supernatural creature or a person with zero morals, it's just a human. Walker wanted to do the right thing and knew in his heart that he wanted to save these people, but his circumstances and choices ended up changing him, further reinforcing that anyone could be Walker even if they have good intentions. There's a conversation like this with Conrad earlier, where Walker sort of apologizes by saying that he never meant to hurt anyone, to which Conrad replies that no one ever does. No one inherently wants to hurt other people, but sometimes it happens, and for Walker, by the time he noticed, it was too late. All of this circles back to the other piece of this game I haven't mentioned, and that's our choices. What changed because of them, and did they matter? Of course not. If I had a nickel for how many games he talked about on this channel that made me rethink my life while also making my choices pointless, I'd have two. And Soma was the first one. None of the choices we made mattered. All of it was just stuff that mattered at the moment. Killing Riggs or letting him burn was only there to comment on the player's current mindset. Same with the civilians that killed Lugo. The prisoners weren't even real, and saving or letting Ghoul die didn't matter as we got the info off his corpse anyway. The choices were pointless, but once again, we shouldn't have even been here to make these decisions in the first place. Spec Ops The Line is a fantastic game with an incredible story and message. It's a game that makes the player out to be the villain, which doesn't happen often. Usually there's some kind of loose justification for these actions. But Spec Ops continually tries to undermine that justification by showing you how much destruction you've caused. Despite all of this though, we do have to end the video on a bit of a sad note. While the game was met with positive reviews, everything after release was disastrous. Critically, the game succeeded, but commercially, no one cared about it, as its sales were quite low. Which seems to be a running theme for this series, as the line is not a standalone title, but rather the eighth game in a series called Spec Ops. The original games were released around the late 90s and early 2000s, but didn't seem to gather much press either, as the series went into hibernation for over a decade before the line was released. But thanks to its failure to garner audiences, there's a good chance we won't ever get a sequel. Speaking of Jaeger, they too sadly haven't got much success either, as their first game, Jaeger, back in 2003, was met with mixed reviews and mediocre sales. And the other two games they made after Spec Ops, called Dreadnought and The Cycle Frontier, also seem to have suffered the same fate. Jaeger can't catch a break, it seems, but I do hope the team knows that at the very least they struck gold here with the line. It may not have sold well, but most people that played the game, including me, know how impressive this product was, even if many people didn't buy it originally. Despite its sad aftermath, I'm actually thankful I was able to play this game, as it's games like this that I've recently come to appreciate a lot more. Many games nowadays are long-winded experiences created with the sole intention of keeping you playing as long as possible, but I found that a short and sweet experience can do the same thing with greater success. Two games I love dearly and will never shut up about are Firewatch and What Remains of Edith Finch. These games are incredibly short, taking no longer than four hours to beat, and yet despite only playing them once three years ago, I can vividly remember most of their events due to how impactful they were. And while it's only been a couple of weeks since I've played, I'm sure Spec Ops The Line will be one of those games too. I'm not sure when I'll play this game again. It could be weeks, months, years, or hell, this might be the last time I play it. But none of that matters, as the story and the events that took place here are never going to leave my mind, and that is something I feel is often overlooked. You don't need to play a game multiple times, racking it over hundreds or thousands of hours for it to be memorable. Sometimes all it takes is one. One incredibly impactful and unforgettable experience. Thanks for watching. Thank you for watching today, and I hope you enjoyed. Bit of a short one today, at least compared to the fact that my last analysis video was six hours long, but Spec Ops was a short game, so it was going to be a short video. I'm not sure what the next video will be, as I have a couple of projects I've been working on in the background, and I should probably finish those up. But if you turn on notifications for the channel, you'll be able to know when videos start production, as well as how close they are to being finished. It's something I've been doing recently, and a lot of you seem to enjoy it, so I'll keep posting more updates. Regardless, like the video if you enjoy, and subscribe if you're new. Thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and take care everyone. Goodbye.